This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Thank you very much for this um, kind introduction. Let me just pour a glass of water. Um, when I did my last test run, I was just shy of 35 minutes, so we should be fine. Let's see, where can I can put this. Um, thank you uh, for inviting me. I'm extraordinarily honored to be included in a group of such distinguished speakers and to be allowed to speak here uh, in the halls of this venerable institution. My talk has two sections. First, the first section explores Vabo confession and the second Benjamin on fashion. These uh, sections differ in structure because the way in which each of the two patrons of our conference thought and wrote about fashion differs too. Whereas Warburg actually treated the topic of fashion concretely in one of his historical studies, to which I'll get in a minute, uh, Benjamin has a number of theoretical uh, statements to offer, but their specific applicability or implication with the realm of fashion is more difficult to trace, I'd say. Yet, in line with the spirit of yesterday's call for a reconstruction of the concrete image worlds, which Benjamin refers to in his work, and that was Michael Diaz, of course, who, um, who made that call. So, in spirit with that call, I have tried to research a hypothetical fashion context in the sense of dresses and their images from which Benjamin might have begun to treat the topic of mode in a more general manner. Uh, I should also warn you that especially this segment is exploratory, new, and uh, a little bit unguarded. Uh, so um, quite a number of the things I have to say in that vein are conjectural, and this also concerns the image track that accompanies my talk. Um, Whereas Warburg's work refers to a clearly circumscribed group of pictures soliciting the pictorial dimension of Benjamin's work uh, requires a greater mass with sometimes not so clearly defined borders and boundaries, which makes for noticeable differences in tempo and thoroughness in which I'm going to go through my visual examples. Um, in any case, I'll be curious and um, grateful to hear comments and critique. I will begin with the topic of fashion in Abi Warburg that he addressed most explicitly in his article Über Imprese Amorose auf den frühesten florentinischen Kupferstichen on Imprese Amorose in the earliest uh, Florentine um, copper etchings. This text appeared first in uh, 1905 in an Italian translation in the journal Rivista Data. Here, Warburg turns to a series of small circular etchings from the 15th century, which he speculates originated as decoration for the top lids of so-called galanterie-schachteln, cylindric boxes of, I, I believe the, the term might be gallantry items, the Italian word is scatolino or bossoli da spezie, quote, wie sie der elegante Liebhaber damals der Dame seines Herzens zu überreichen pflegte, as the elegant lover liked to present to the dame of his heart. One such elegant lover, uh, Warburg also finds portrait on one such tondo, and the lover is on the left-hand side, obviously. Um, he identifies him as Lorenzo Magnifico, whom he sees here as im Glanze einer modischen Livrea dargestellt. Über dem eng getäfelten, pelzverbrämten Wams, Wams hängt auch die Cintola alla Parigina Traforata in ihr Lata herab, wie sie etwa um diese Zeit in dem Laden des Maso Finigera für die elegante Welt hergestellt wurde. Zur Livrea gehören auch die merkwürdigen Stiefel, deren Schaft von künstlichen Blättern gebildet wird. He sees him here represented in the splendor of a fashionable livrea. Over the narrowly patched, fur-trimmed waistcoat hangs the Cientola alla Parigina Traforata in Yelata, as it was being manufactured for the elegant world about that time in the shop of Maso Finigera. The strange boots, whose legs consist of artificial leaves, are part of his outfit. While Lorenzo here figures as the epitome of Florentine quattrocento elegance, his female opposite, Warburg identifies her with the help of his friend and Italian translator Poggi as Lucrezia Aringelli, the object of Lorenzo's adoration, is more complicated to read in terms of style. Warburg's first account of the female figure states that Lucrezia befindet sich in dem Bezug auf ihre Toilette in einem eigentümlichen Stadium des Übergangs. As far as her outfit is concerned, Lucrezia is in a peculiar state of transition. Elements of this transition that shine forth in Lucrezia's non-unified heterogeneous wardrobe are the taille, the waist, that is à la mode ausgeschnitten, cut out à la mode, which contrasts with the proto-baroque fringed shoulder applications, soft epaulettes, so to speak. It is especially visible in her headgear. 
Auf dem Kopf trägt sie den schweren Fermalio. Das Haar dagegen ist allein den Fahle frisiert und weit in freien Locken lustig nach hinten. Zwei Flügel, wie sie der etruskischen Medusa eigen, wachsen über den Schläfen empor. Die höhere antikischer ideale Art der Frauengestalt mit diesem direkt aus der Antike übernommenen Symbol andeutend. On her head she carries the heavy fermalio, while her hair is coiffed a la ninfale, and gaily flows behind her in open curls. Two wings, such as they uh, characterize the Etruscan Medusa, grow from her temples. They indicate the higher ideal state of this female figure by taking the symbol directly from antiquity. To Warburg, her outfit intends the site of a transition from the schwerlastende Modeprunk à la Française zur idealen, schwungvollen Gewandung à l'Antica, from the heavyweight, fashion splendor à la Française to the ideal, dynamic garment à l'Antica. This relationship between the steifer ornamentale Trachtenrealismus, the stiff ornamental realism of traditional costume, and the antiquisierender, schwungvoll bewegter Gewandung, the antiquifying, agitated garment, Warburg saw also treated in a series of etchings um, attributed to a certain Baccio Baldini, whom he believes to have identified as Bodicelli. And I'm uh, first showing you these two etchings, these two pieces, and then um, the sections of the images that Warburg focuses on. On one print, left-hand side, finden wir eine tanzende Dame, abgebildet im fossilen Staat der echten burgundischen Mode. Ein plumpes Schleppkleid fesselt sie an den Boden, den Kopf belastet der Inar mit breit herabwallendem Schleier. So on one hand we find a dancing dame, depicted in her fossil attire of genuine Burgundian fashion. A clumsy dress with a train ties her to the ground. The head is burdened by the Inar with its broadly plunging veil. On a slightly later print, uh, right hand side, the constellation has changed. Here hat der antike Schmetterling die burgundische Lava gesprengt. Viktorienhaft wallt das Gewand und auch die Medusenflügel am Kopf haben die stumpfsinnig prahlerische Spitzenhaube verjagt. So here the antique butterfly has exploded or has literally burst the Burgundian cocoon. The garment flows in the style of victory and also the head's uh, Medusa wings have chased away the boasting laced bonnet. What was combined within the outfit of a single female figure on the tondo has now been pulled apart and is distributed over two images whose combination describes a passage in time, in which the Nordische Trachtenbarberei, the Nordic barbarism of traditional costume, becomes the object of stilistische Umformung, stylistic reshaping. Material from the Romantische Mittelalterliche Stoffkreis, the romantic medieval, uh, from Romantic medieval subject matter, has been substituted by a wardrobe a l'antica. Now, how can we read these statements systematically with regard to the logic of fashion? First of all, at the risk uh, of stating the obvious, there is a way to read Warburg in which he seems to talk about fashionable styles of clothing, two competing trends that each refer to earlier styles of dress. That is, he puts, the full weight, he puts full weight here on the mediating prepositional character of a la, as in a la a antica and a la francese. In this manner, there would be one referential mode of clothing that describes dressing in the style of France and another that means dressing in the style of antiquity. If this is the case, the notion of a Trachtenrealismus à la Française for the heavy Burgundian garments is certainly uh, the more intriguing pole of the opposition and this has to do with the term Tracht that can be frequently found in Warburg's uh, notes where it often co-occurs along with the uh, concept of Schmuck which I believe derives from Semper and the third term Gerät which I believe is also a Semperian term. For Tracht usually signifies a style of clothing that lies outside from uh, that lies uh, outside of or historically antecedent to the logic of fashion. Etymologically derived from the old High German Trachter or Tracht, and going back to the same word, uh, same root as Tragen, Tracht literally means what one carries, as in traditional costume. It, de it designates a long durée style of clothing that is only subject to minimal changes while being handed down from generation to generation. It is carried on as embodied in the Latin notion of tradition. The transformative and differential law of fashion stands in opposition to this hyperstable type of stylistic continuity. However, and this is where we return to Warburg's argument, it is possible that fashion refers to and appropriates the styles of Tracht, which it then shifts into and preserves in the form of a differential value within uh, the fashion panorama. If this is the case, uh, for Warburg's interpretation of the Imprese, one could understand the alleged clumsiness of Trachtenrealismus, the clunkiness of its adornments, as indicators for its gradually being sucked into the zone of the Demodé. Warburg would then be reconstructing a potential Florentine perspective from which Trachtenrealismus would have begun to go out of fashion while Alantica is becoming en vogue. Yet, 
Although this argument seems entirely plausible in itself, I'm not fully convinced that Warburg intended his text to be read and understood in this manner. My hesitation stems from the observation that throughout his entire article, Warburg exclusively uses the qualifying term mode, most often in the form of a prefix, in relation to the French way of dressing. For example, when he mentions the waistline that is cut a la mode, he's referring to an older element in Lucrezia's outfit that is now juxtaposed with its newer counterparts. He also speaks of the Burgundische Mode and of the schwer lastende Mode Prunk à la Française. He never uses the epithet Mode in combination with the style of antiquity, which he instead tends to describe as ideal. So what I'm aiming at is the possibility that Warburg might have conceptualized the shift from dress à la Française to à l'antica not as a mere transition from one fashion style to another, but rather as the substitution of the heavily decorous and over ornate principle of dressing à la mode to a way of dressing that is not subject to the laws of fashion. This style, which is not fashion, would offer a way out of the contemporary alternations of in and out by taking recourse to the classical. In this sense, Warburg would continue the classicist tradition that he sees in the historical reference, uh, that sees in the historical reference to the forms of antiquity, a privileged type of historical recourse, a position held in German Germanophone culture, at least since Winkelmann. What would set Warburg apart from this strand would be his emphasis on the moving figure, whereas most other types of classicism emphasize architectural or sculptural static stillness. And uh, I'm just showing you two images um, taken in Munich in 1903 uh, of Isadora Duncan um, the, um, to, to uh, visualize that Warburg obviously is operating within one um, kind of one fashion panorama um, where s other people may follow similar concerns. Warburg, uh, Gombrich reports Warburg having attended uh, a performance by Isadora Duncan but not having, not having been particularly impressed. So um, I think he found it a little bit posy. Um, be this as it may. This is going to be my next image. In any case, the recourse of fashion, the recourse to fashion allowed Warburg to perform an important epistemological shift that redefines the conditions for interpreting the animated draperies of the Bewegtes Beiwerk, and this is why I'm showing this in particular, and images in general. For the Impresa are of course not the only case in which Warburg contrasts light and flowing textiles with heavy, pendant, and more static styles of dress. One famous example is Ghirlandaio's Birth of St. John the Baptist, where Warburg finds animated and static types of clothing combined in a single image. However, in the case of Ghirlandaio, the bulging folds of the skirt and the long scarf-like band that protrudes far into space in a wide curve are at least in part motivated through the, through the rushing movement with which the fruit-bearing servant bursts into the chamber where the protagonists and witnesses of the nativity scene seem to be frozen still. For Warburg, these moving accoutrements qualify her as a figural return of antique nymphae. What is striking in the case of the Impresa etchings, what is striking in the case of the Impresa etchings, is that they offer the possibility for such a comparison between animated and static drapery, animated and static draperies across a series of images, and hence don't recenter this contrast around the figural representation of motor action. Rather, the difference between static and moving textiles here becomes the result of a succession in time that does not equate the depiction of the body's transposition in space. To borrow Deleuze's terms, the, uh, the model of fashion, as derived from the Imprese, allowed Warburg to leave the realm of the movement image. Fashion enabled him to shift into the register of the time image, I'd say. I would argue that this particular step namely to recognize in fashion and its phenomena the potential for a genuine theorization of the relationship of time and image, establishes a strong connection between the work of Warburg and that of Walter Benjamin. Benjamin's most succinct statements to this end figure in the context of his elaborations on the uh, dialectic spirit, the dialectical image. These can be found prominently in his last text, the Thesen über den Begriff der Geschichte, the thesis on the concept of history, but also in the unfinished Passagenwerk, the Arcades project, where they tend to cost him two of the 30, 36 thematically organized so-called convolutes of notes that make up the work. And these are convolut N, Erkenntnistheoretisches, and Theorie des Fortschritts, so that's epistemology and the theory of progress, and the appropriately grouped convolute B on mode, on fashion. 
In the convolute on epistemology, Benjamin advances the following definition, which I'm going to read in its entirety, first in German and then in my own very clumsy English translation. Uh, Matthew, Ram Matthew Rampley had a much better version yesterday, but I didn't want to copy you. I think I saw him somewhere. Bild ist dasjenige, worin das Gewesene mit dem Jetzt blitzhaft zu einer Konstellation zusammentritt. Mit anderen Worten, Bild ist die Dialektik im Stillstand. Denn während die Beziehung der Gegenwart zur Vergangenheit eine rein zeitliche, kontinuierliche ist, ist die des Gewesenen zum Jetzt dialektisch, ist nicht Verlauf, sondern Bild sprunghaft. An image is that in which what has been and the now enter into a constellation and they do so in a flash-like manner. In other words, the image is a dialectic at standstill. For, while the relationship of the present to the past is purely temporal and continuous, the relationship between what has been and the now is dialectic. It is not an ongoing process, but an image, like a jump, sprunghaft, like a leap, it can also be a gap. Sprung can also be a, like a gap in the pavement, or a crack in the pavement. One of the primary impulses of this definition is a critique of a notion of history as founded in a linear concept of time. The zeitliche, kontinuierliche, the temporal, continuous relation of Gegenwart and Vergangenheit, of present and past, conceptualizes history as a continuous line in the space of time. An uninterrupted vector leads from past to present. The relation of present and past exemplified in the Bild, by, contract, uh, by contrast, is first of all blitzhaft and nicht verlauf, it is flash-like and not processual, that is, it is not the product of a linear, even development, and it is second sprunghaft, it is uh, has the character of a leap. Tellingly, Benjamin found one of his primary models for this type of temporal relationship in the field of fashion, and in the practice of historical reactualizations of bygone styles. In the 14th uh, thesis on the concept of history, he writes, Die Mode hat die Witterung für das Aktuelle, wo immer es sich im Dickicht des Einst bewegt. Sie ist der Tigersprung ins Vergangene. Fashion has an instinct for the current where it moves in the thicket of once. That is literally his formulation, the thicket of, of once, das Dickicht des Einst. It is the tiger's leap into the past. And in the very same context, Benjamin offers one a concrete example for such a nonlinear short circuiting between two temporally remote yet suddenly connected instants. Die französische Revolution verstand sich als wiedergekehrtes Rom. Sie zitierte das alte Rom genauso wie die Mode eine vergangene Tracht zitiert. The French Revolution saw itself as a returned or a renewed Rome. It quoted ancient Rome just like fashion quotes a bygone type of costume. So just as the French revolutionaries reached for temporally distant Latin antiquity, fashion leaps into the thicket of once in order to reintroduce what was temporally disconnected and forgotten into a current context. Tonangebend ist nur das Neueste, aber doch nur, wo es im Medium des Ältesten, Gewesensten, Gewohntesten auftaucht. Only the most recent sets the tone in fashion, yet only where it emerges in the medium of the oldest, the past and the most familiar. Fashion thus converts the temporally disconnected and forgotten into the newest, and the mechanism of this sudden leap-like conversion is dialectics. Dieses Schauspiel, wie das jeweils allerneueste im Medium des Gewesenen sich bildet, macht das eigentliche dialektische Schauspiel der Mode. This spectacle, in which the radically new is formed in the medium of the past, makes up the actual dialectical spectacle of fashion. The structure of this dialectical relation defies a linear concept of time in a double way. First, because the transformation of forgotten and latent into current occurs abruptly. Instead of a stretched out even development, there is a sudden dialectical switch of out of fashion into in fashion. Second, because this re-entry of the latent and forgotten presupposes a qualitative break that previously must have separated now and once. It is precisely its disconnection from the current that qualifies the demodé as possible material for the generation of the allerneueste, because it has dropped out of sight as it were. The Demodé's repository is das Herz der abgeschafften Dinge, the heart of obsolete things. That is, an accumulation of elements that the course of time has eliminated. Now, bearing this definition of the dialectical image temporal structure and its analogy to fashion in mind, I'd now like to turn the glove inside out, so to speak. In addition to reconstructing how Benjamin makes recourse to the temporality of fashion to model the temporal structure of the dialectical image, I would argue, we can also benefit from looking concretely at the specific and particular fashion fragments and practices which he points to in the Passagenwerk notes and which surrounded him, so to speak, when he was developing his theory of fashion. So instead of trying to understand the structural analogy between dialectical image and fashion, I now want to look at or recreate uh, the specific fashion context in which this uh, notion of the dialectical image took its shape. Uh, I'll do my best. It's sketchy. 
my fault. I'm sure it can be reconstructed in a much, much more thorough manner, but um, this is how far I got. So there is indeed a, a particular privileged angle, I'd say, in Benjamin's general view of fashion, and that is the angle of surrealism. In the Passagenwerks Fashion Convolute, he calls die Mode die Vorgängerin, nein, die ewige Platzhalterin des Surrealismus. Fashion is the precursor, no, the eternal placeholder of surrealism. And when taking a stance against the modernist architectural theori theorist Gideon's wholesale dismissal of the so-called Ogu Reize, the Ogu charms of the 19th century and its decorations, Benjamin clarified what surrealism seemed to promise to him. Gideon recognized in the strade of mid-19th century early industrial and commercial architectures the nascent stages of the modernist construction systems which he advocated. And I'm showing you here images from Bauen in Frankreich. This is, um, I believe this is the Printemps, um, Print should be the Printemps, um, what's, a, what's a Kaufhaus in English? A warehouse? Uh, department. department store, thank you. <laughs> I believe that's the, that's the Printemps and uh, that's the Bauhaus. <laughs> Not the Kaufhaus, that's the Bauhaus. <laughs> um, sorry, that set me off. Um, Gideon recognized in the strata of mid 19th century early industrial and commercial architectures the nascent stages of the modernist construction systems which he advocated, as can be seen here, but that ultimately needed to be stripped from their overbearing ornamental and historically referential layers. Not so Benjamin, who held, dass der Reiz, mit dem diese künstlerischen Draperien auf uns wirken, verrät, dass auch sie lebenswichtige Stoffe für uns enthalten. Das beweist die Fixierung der Surrealisten an diese Dinge genauso wie ihre Ausbeutung durch die gegenwärtige Mode. He held that the charm with which these artistic draperies affect, affect us betrays uh, that they contain elements that are vital for us. This is proven by the surrealist fixation on these things, as well as by the exploration, exploitation through current fashion. And I'll just go blank for a minute. So one of the elements that fascinated Benjamin in surrealism was the latter's acting out of an aesthetic and even effective connection to the 19th century, in which Benjamin recognized an articulation of a generally prevailing taste for, let's call them Victorian styles, you could also call them the styles of the Belle Epoque, or if you speak in German you'd say Wilhelminische Stile, but he's working on, on that connection and he says surrealism embodies that, and for him it's important to understand that. Uh, one example that Benjamin mentions repeatedly in this vein is Louis Aragon's novel Le Paysan de Paris, parts of which are set in the 19th century Passage de l'Opéra that was facing impeding demolition when Aragon memorialized this largely defunct former commercial architecture in his book. Another example that provides an even more concrete case of a sur surrealist appropriation of 19th century aesthetics is the reprint, or rather the reproduction, of segments from Stéphane Malamé's 1874 short-lived real-life fiction of a fashion journal titled La Dernière Mode in the 1935 winter issue of the surrealist journal Minotaur. And that's the um, cover of that really beautiful, beautiful issue. It has a man Ray's photo of uh, Duchamp's large glass and a reproduction of one of Duchamp's rotating discs on the front and inside you find uh, that's, uh, these are two pages. I'm sorry for the, I wasn't allowed to scan them properly. Benjamin excerpts passages from Malamé's reprinted articles in the Fashion Convolute, so he reads Minotaur. To these, um, and these are um, the originals from La Dernière Mode, and you can see the continuity. So this is in Minotaur, and this is the, the original version of that image uh, that appeared in La Dernière Mode. To these one could add the example of collage novels, such as Max Ernst's 1934 Une semaine de bonté, in which the artist recomposes illustrations, etchings, and other visual material from the 19th century into new sceneries and narrative arrangements. And I'll just show you as an example a few uh, <coughs> passages, uh, pages, excuse me. This one's really beautiful. Um, the, the three pages that I just showed you are all taken from the section La Cour du Dragon, the Dragon's Court, and these are juxtapositions that uh, Werner Spies reconstructed, um, where, he, um, where he compares uh, the Max Ernst version, left-hand side, to, their, to the original source. And they are, these are from Alphonse Denery's 1885 novel Le Martyr. Sorry. This 
ones as well. So you can see really beautiful how the surrealists actually work through and work with that historic material. Now, these examples, although more narrowly confined to the fields of literature and art, already carry a number of fashion references. Malamy's literary production in La Dernière Mode is situated between poetry and fashion journalism. The accompanying, uh, the accompanying illustrations yield reliable uh, impressions of a lady's toilette in the mid-1870s. And uh, my selection from Ernst's selection from Den Rie was intended to demonstrate that one of the surrealist artist's points of fascination indeed lay in the masses and layers of 19th century costume, which you see in these crinolines that are reproduced. But what about fashion itself? Because, as a reminder, Benjamin claims that it is not just surrealism, but also contemporary fashion that is fixated on the 19th century. Again, the mode convolute offers a hint, this time in the form of an excerpt from Helen Grund's 1935 essay from Wesen der Mode on the essence of fashion that was originally held as a lecture at the Munich uh, Meisterschule für Mode, uh, the Munich Fashion School, and shortly afterwards published in a limited edition as a slender booklet. And that's the cover. And you see the peacock feather, beautiful art deco stylized peacock feather. A close friend of Benjamin's from the late 1920s onwards, throughout the 1930s, Grund had left Germany with her husband Franz Hessel for Paris, where she served as a fashion correspondent for the Frankfurter Zeitung, whose magazine supplement Für die Frau regularly featured her reports from couture shows, but also on all sorts of other trends in fashion. Grund must count as Benjamin's most important source as far as the fashion of his own period is concerned, I'd say, I'd, I'd argue that. In fact, if I haven't overlooked anything, Grund's Vom Wesen der Mode is the only text on the subject of fashion to be quoted in the Passagenwerk that is strictly contemporary to Benjamin's own enterprise. The majority in the Mode Convolute are historical documents, and I'm sure Cornelia Zumbusch is going to talk about a few of them, like Simmel, and if you go back further into the 19th century, you have Fischer and Ehring, and the, the, that essay by Grund is the only one that is uh, contemporary to what Benjamin is writing about fashion in 1935. Um, also of art historical interest there is a brief excerpt from Charles Blanc who founded the Gazette des Beaux-Arts in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the Mode Convolute. In Vom Wesen der Mode, and this is again a passage quoted by Benjamin, Grund also talks about the structural connection between the past and the present in fashion. The inspiration of couturiers entzündet sich an den Anregungen, die eine bewegte Aktualität bietet. Da nun aber keine Gegenwart sich völlig von der Vergangenheit loslied, loslöst, bietet ihm auch die Vergangenheit Anregung. The designer's inspiration is sparked by impulses that a dynamic present has to offer. But since no present is entirely detached from the past, he also uh, receives impulses from that um, former period. And Grund also provides a concrete example from her and Benjamin's fashion present that establishes, establishes exactly the connection between the 1930s and the 19th century. Quote, das in die Stirn gerückte Hütchen, das wir, in der das wir der manet ausstellung zu verdanken haben, beweist nichts anderes, als dass, sie ein, als dass wir eine neue Bereitschaft haben, uns mit dem Ende des vorigen Jahrhunderts auseinanderzusetzen. The little hat that is pushed down onto the front, which we owe to the Manet exhibition, proves nothing but our new readiness to engage with the end of the previous century. So she's talking about a trend in Parisian fashion. There's a small hat that is coming into fashion that she relates to a Manet exhibition, so paintings from the 19th century that must have taken place in Paris. I've tried to research this, and in 1932 there is indeed a Manet exhibition at the, um, what's now the Jeu de Paume, at the Orangerie in the Tuileries, and Unfortunately, I was unable to locate that catalog in Berlin. Berlin doesn't have the catalog, and I couldn't do the conjecture. So I would have loved to show you one of these images from the Manet show, and then you could move onwards and see and try to find historical examples from 1930s fashion where you can actually see that little hat coming back into style. What Grund is pointing to in this one anecdotal example seems indeed representative for the fashion history of the 19th that can be read as the following, and this is really provisional, rushed, and very much abbreviated examples, perhaps demonstrate, as a return to stylistic patterns and most of all the silhouettes that stem from the second half of the 19th century and that had laid dormant while the fashion of the 1920s propagated a more androgynous, loose, and less constructed line. And now I'm really just going to walk you, or rush you rather, through a totally improvised squished development of fashion from late 1920s, mid-1920s to about mid-1930s. Uh, these are dresses by Jean Patou, which I've selected because Patou, who's nowadays largely forgotten as a designer, although he was very important and very influential at the time, he's kind of a fashion hero for Helen Grund. If you read the critiques, she always talks about him. And you see the rect rectangular silhouettes, which are um, 
slightly androgynous, also um, very uh, flowy garments. This would be the more evening wear version of that. And just to, to give you an idea of the, of the kind of uh, general tone, fashion tone of the period, that dress was uh, processed as curvy. That's the re return of curves. So you can imagine how geometrical the entire imagination must have been before. Uh, these are two um, rather androgynously cut um, beach outfits by uh, Elsa Schiaparelli, whom I'm going to talk about in a minute, a little bit more. And this is uh, what has changed in the 1930s. So you see the big um, bulging um, upper sleeves and the, uh, the flowing skirt, which uh, harked back to uh, the late 19th century. And the right hand, that's, uh, that's a patu gown, which is um, Sarah Bernard inspired, which you can recognize in the face. And uh, this would be a Schiaparelli gown. Here down you see the return of uh, what's called a, a taffeta ruffle or a concon ruffle. Also the bulging, skirt, uh, bulging sleeves. This is admittedly uh, a strong example. That's a, 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 um, a film costume that Schiaparelli designed for Mae West, who's kind of the embodiment of curvaceousness as far as the female body is concerned. But you can see on the right-hand side, that's a jacket that uh, Schiaparelli designed that has a similar hourglass uh, silhouette that was not designed for Mae West. So that would have been a regular, regular jacket. And this is uh, already, this is late 1930s. Again, Schiaparelli, where you can see the return of the so-called uh, bustle bottom, which is basically a return to the, to the silhouette of the so-called Cul de Paris, or the constructed um, um, enhanced female back part. <laughs> and this is how it would look in, in, in um, this is how it would look in color. Um, one difference to 19th century and earlier fashions, this has no, um, no uh, metal or bone substructure. This is all draping. So this is sheer textile, whereas the proper Cru de Paris has actually a constructional, a, 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 a metal, light metal or a bone infrastructure below. So these examples are all by two designers. One of them is Patou, as I said, and the other is Elsa Schiaparelli, whose work was perceived as offering a particularly marked return to the stars of the Belle Epoque. The story circles back to Benjamin if one realizes that Schiaparelli was also the couturier most closely associated with the uh, surrealist movement. And these are uh, two monkey fur boots that clearly uh, respond to um, um, Merit Oppenheim's famous Frühstück in Pelz, Breakfast uh, in Fur. So that's the fur trimmed um, teacup. This is from a little bit later. That's uh, a sweater that has front and back monkey fur trimming. These are the so-called claw gloves. Um, left hand side, you see them as a detail. Right hand side, in a photo by Georg von Honing Hühne. And this is interesting. This is a Schiaparelli gown, not particularly surrealist in, in, in appearance. But that was an image that was published in 1938 in Harper's Bazaar. And it's a photo. It's based on a photo by Georg von Honing Hühne, or it is labeled as a photo by Georg von Honing Hühne, who was a fashion photographer. But it has been treated in some way to look exactly like the etchings that, my, uh, that Max Ernst was using from the late 19th century. So that would have been, that's not a surrealist pu publication. It's really a fashion journal at that moment. In fact, her designs, so Schiaparelli's designs, also figure in the Passagenwerk as surrealist fashion, albeit anonymously, and through the intermediary of Helen Grund's work. Paraphrasing Grund, Benjamin points to tendencies in current fashion in which millinery, and more exactly women's hats, explore die verschiedenen Möglichkeiten symbolisch die Geschlechtsorgane zum Spielen. They explore different options of playfully and symbolically alluding to genitalia. At the first moment, the statement seems bizarre. Yet in its oddness, the formulation unmistakably, unmistakably refers to an otherwise unidentified source, namely a series of hat designs by the designer Schiaparelli. These are photographed by Man Ray, and the one on the bottom right is even um, modeled by Schiaparelli herself. These images, accompanied an article by the surrealist poet and thinker Tristan Sarrat, titled D'un certain automatisme du goût on a certain automatism of taste again in Minotaur in 1934. Zara's commentary on this headgear that reads its protrusions, bulges, 
slits, mound-like openings, or quite simply tiny erections, as a collapsing of the morphological inventory of genitalia onto the, fo onto the form of the hat, accentuates in an admittedly pointed manner what became evident to many observers of his period. Fashion was on its way toward a rather marked display of the sex and also the sexually dimorphic body. This sexing of the silhouette is, of course, another maneuver through which the appearance of dresses returned to the heavy curves uh, and the heavily curved silhouette of late 19th century outfits that fashion in the 1920s had practically eradicated. So, and I'm coming to a close now. It seems that fashion, and especially the fashion closest to the surrealist movement, namely Schiaparelli, indeed executed its tiger sleep into the 19th century. In doing so, these fashion practices highlight two points, especially in comparison to the styles of the 1920s, against, against which they developed. First, although the famous leap into the past indeed constitutes a structural possibility of fashion, not all fashions rely on its execution. A late 1920s Jean Patou dress functioned perfectly well without setting any sort of historical reference. So what is new here against the 1920s is not just the content of the historical reference, but the act of a trans-period fashion reach. When Benjamin chooses to elevate this temporally discontinuous mode of stylistic, stylistic referencing to a feature of fashion as such, he is less speaking about fashion on a general level, which may or may not choose to reach out to bygone eras. What he is in fact doing is turning a characteristic of the fashion of his own period into a general trait of fashion at large. This generalization of the concerns of his present goes even further. Reading Benjamin with Grund's remarks about the willingness to engage with the 19th century uh, makes clear that the entire Passagenwerk's intended recourse to the Belle Epoque uh, may, in fact, at least partially have been as participating in and surfing on the larger wave with which cultural phenomena of that bygone period were washed back into the present. So far from being exclusively a heroic attempt at saving those elements of culture that have been relegated into a limbo of latency by the forces of progress, Benjamin's project indeed seeks to participate in or make use of their reconversion into elements that are becoming in again. That is, Benjamin is not alone in to work through the cultural content of the late 19th century. He writes in the company of fashion and he knows it. With regard to the specific temporal politics of fashion, Warburg and Benjamin differ strongly from each other. Whereas Warburg, whose scholarly work consists majorly of concrete historical case studies, would at first sight appear to be adhering to an orthodox view that places fashion within the continuum of history, Benjamin could initially be, be perceived as offering the more audacious conceptualization of time in that he proposes an abstract theory of the temporal mechanics of the fashion image, das dialectische Bild. In the end, this comparison may need to be slightly adjusted. While Benjamin founds his theory of the dialectical image on the discontinuous temporality of fashion, he still thinks firmly within the continuum of history. Warburg's fashion theory, by contrast, does not rely on the dimension of history, at least not on a primary level. Although Warburg formally indexes his styles à l'antica and à la française with certain historical reference points, these references are secondary to his actual interest, namely the polarizing switch from one style heavily static into another, agitatedly animated. This switch can be described as a historical alternation, but it need not necessarily be one. It can be merely temporal. Benjamin's theory uh, of fashion, by contrast, seems ultimately to be characterized by a much stronger investment in his present, the 1930s, and his Vorgeschichte, the 19th century. As I have tried to show, the particular fashion of his specific Jetztzeit may have had a stronger share in the design of the dialectical image than is usually acknowledged. Thank you.